Good morning, friends. Today's scripture reading is from the New Testament, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplish, accomplishes all things, according to his counsel and will, so that we who were first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the zeal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption, as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. The scripture we read today is the beginning of the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Actually, it is thought by many scholars that this was a circular letter meant to be shared with a number of churches. In fact, it has been suggested that this was intended to be a sermon to be preached in the churches. Although Paul had spent several years working with the Ephesus church, this letter does not address specific issues of the church or name names like Paul did in his letter to the Philippian church. So maybe the scholars are right. Regardless, this letter is full of Christian doctrine. Paul's message is all about the blessed assurance of grace, forgiveness, redemption, and salvation. It's all about our victory in Jesus, who bought our pardon with his redeeming blood. We could easily spend at least a month of Sundays studying this one passage, and I can't possibly do all of this important theology justice in just one sermon. The promises of God, as outlined by Paul here, are just too amazing and important and vast. Like the proclamation in verse 4, that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy, holy, and blameless before him in love. He chose us, you, and me, and others who came before us, and those who will come after us before he created the earth and its inhabitants, and certainly before we were knitted together in our mother's wombs, as David said in Psalm 139. Paul goes on in verse 5 to say that God destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ. Well, what about free will? Our choice to believe or not to believe in Christ. Clearly, what all this means is that in the beginning, God loved us, chose us, and knew what our decision would be. Salvation is a gift to us from God, a gift of grace, totally unearned by us, and really offered in spite of us because of who God is and how much he loves us. It is his to give and ours to accept or not. I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning, as they say, 
but it's good for all of us to look at the basics and know how to explain them. After all, if we can't talk about God's gift of redemption, then how can we effectively share the good news with someone else? Verse 7 is the key to this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. Redemption. It's an interesting term. What it first meant to me as a child was related to the green and pink and yellow gold stamps that my sister and I had the job of licking and pasting into little stamp books so they could be redeemed for all kinds of rewards at the Redemption Store. The Redemption Center was where we got things like our ice cream freezer, our blender, our steam iron, and people's wedding and graduation gifts. It was a joy to go into that store with those little books of stamps and redeem the stamps for treasures. That was my first experience with that precious R word. To the early readers of this scripture, though, redemption was about buying something back, and especially about purchasing freedom for a slave. The term redemption is used in scripture to refer to Jesus' buying the pardon for human sins. We've talked before about how the sin problem and the hard-headedness and hard-heartedness of God's people continue to cause separation between God and his chosen ones throughout human history. God chose to solve the problem of sin and alienation once and for all by sending his only begotten son, Jesus, to be born incarnate in human form and to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins and secure for us God's promise of eternal life. We are all sinners. In his letter to the Romans, chapter 3, verse 23, Paul wrote, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means all, including you and me, of course, are standing in the need of salvation, standing in the need of Jesus, whether we know it or not, whether we believe it or not, and whether we accept the gift of salvation or not. Maybe we haven't done anything that's all that bad in our eyes, but sin is sin. Wrong is wrong. It's not for us to judge what is wrong or whose sin is worst. And we're certainly not supposed to act like the Pharisee who went up to the temple to pray and said, I thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everyone else, for I don't cheat, I don't sin, and I don't commit adultery. I certainly am not like that tax collector. That's Luke 18, 11. Sin also means failing to do things God wants us to do and calls us to do. We all sin in all of these ways, and we need to be aware of our sinful nature and repent. Until we own up to our sin and ask for God's forgiveness, we remain in bondage to sin and death. In a sermon called The Spirit of Bondage and of Adoption, John Wesley described how the spirit of bondage can be transformed into the spirit of adoption. Wesley said, only we can set this transformation in motion. We awaken to our sin. We tire of the anguish of our bondage to it. We ask for God's help. God does not force transformation on us. We must seek adoption. However, God completes the transformation. It is God who, hearing our cries and caring for us like a good parent, now infuses our lives with heavenly healing light. Now our consciousness is dominated no longer by sin and law, but by God's capacity to love, reconcile, and make new. We have the experience of adopted children. Now we rely on the warmth and help of a loving parent. Once we were bound to fear, 
but now we are marked with holiness and happiness that characterizes the family of God. And Wesley's quote. When we accept our pardon, when we trust that Christ is indeed who he says he is and will do for us what he says he will do, then we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. As a brand is a proof of ownership for cattle, as a wax seal marks the important document of a dignitary, as a wedding band signifies a pledge of love and devotion. Once we were no people, but now we are God's people marked with the Holy Spirit. The mark of the Spirit for those who have been born again from above is as visible as the brand or the wax seal or the wedding ring. The Spirit guides our actions and the joy of the Lord permeates our being and the light of Christ shines in us as we give and forgive and love in Jesus' name. Romans eight sixteen through 17 says, The Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, end quote. One of my very favorite hymns, you know, this was a celebration by Charles Wesley of his own inheritance of salvation. These words move me to tears of joy. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain for me to him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that, oh my God, should die for me. We too are chosen, destined, redeemed, and saved according to God's good pleasure, lavish grace, and amazing love. And oh, how we are blessed. What's more, we are called. Paul wrote in verse 11 of today's passage, In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. Paul was speaking of the calling of those earliest disciples to live for the praise of God's glory, not just to say or sing God's praises, but to live for praising God, to live for sharing the good news of redemption and salvation, to live for bringing others to Christ and welcoming them to his kingdom, to live for making disciples. And that wasn't just their calling. Of course, it's ours as well. That calling to live for praising the Lord. Paul went on to say to the church, In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption, as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. End quote. Our inheritance, Paul's and the early Christians, and yours and mine. The common English Bible says it this way. We are called to be an honor to God's glory. I like that wording, to be an honor to God's glory. Living to praise is being an honor to God. It's not just about typing God is good on social media or telling someone what God has done for us, although those are good starts. And it's not just about singing praise songs with one or even a thousand tongues. It's not just what we say or sing. It's what we are, an honor to God's glory. The highest calling of all, 
and the richest blessing. Amen? Let us pray together. Holy God, sinful and disobedient as we are, you have purchased our pardon on the cross through the sacrifice of your only Son, our beloved Savior and Lord, our Redeemer. Through the glory of his grace, he has made us acceptable to you. For this grace and on account of your amazing and unending love and faithfulness, we give you our thanks and praise. We give you ourselves and answer your call to be an honor to your glory. Hallelujah and amen.